bulletin today. Um, if you look at the back of the bulletin there, you can see that the title of today's message is the next events in Jesus' life. When I do my sermons, um, I I go back to the title at the very end of my sermon once I know what my sermon's about, right? That's, that's a good way to do it. But I'm not much of a title guy because that's not too creative of a title or anything like that. When I, when I come up with a good title for my sermon, I'm like, yes, that's great, topping it off. This wasn't one of those titles for my sermons there because what we're doing today is we're simply going on from, from what we've been doing the last few weeks here uh, a few weeks ago, we covered Joseph and Mary being told that they would, the Messiah would be born to them. So we covered that. Then we covered John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus the next week. And then last week, we covered the birth of Jesus and the shepherds coming to see Jesus. But today, what we're doing is covering the next events in Jesus' life, as the title of the sermon says. So it might not be creative, but it is accurate on what we're talking about today. So it's tough coming up with titles. If you, anyways, hey, all right. So <laughs> so that's this is exactly what we're doing today. Um, again, at the end of the message last week, we read the Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20 verse there, talking about Jesus being born and the shepherds coming. Um, this week, we're taking a look at the next couple of things in Jesus' life. We're looking at Simeon's prophecy over the life of Jesus, we're looking at Anna praising God because of Jesus. And these two things, they take place just eight days after the birth of Jesus. The next event that is recorded happens a year or two later after the birth of Jesus, and that's the family's escape to Egypt after the Magi come and visit them. So if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 2, you know we're going to keep reading from, from where we ended off last week, starting at verse 21 there. Luke chapter 2, 21. And it reads, Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the, angels, even bef- by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And we're going to keep that in our mind towards the end of the message. I'll cover that again. But at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the baby in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what were being what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of my heart will be revealed. Many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Saying that to Mary. So following the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 6 through 8, Mary and Joseph, they take that five-mile trip north to Jerusalem uh, to offer the sacrifice at the temple to make Mary clean again because a, a woman, after giving birth, was unclean for 40 days after the birth of a son. Um, it's interesting if you read Mosaic Law, if it's the birth of a daughter, that, that time period is actually longer uh, than it is for the birth of a son. But, and I, you know, historians say, scholars say the part of the reason for that is because of the circumcision that takes place eight days later takes some of that uncleanliness away or, or something like that. But uh, when they went to the temple for these sacrifices, Simeon, he raised up Jesus, and Jesus was about six weeks old when Simeon was holding him, according to the 40 days later uh, 
and Mary being allowed to offer those sacrifices. And from that passage we read, we know that Simeon, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, was waiting for the Messiah to be presented to him. And he was guided by the Holy Spirit to the temple that day, the same day that Mary and Joseph went to the temple. So it seems he doesn't, it wasn't someone that would normally be at the temple, but because the Holy Spirit told him to go there, God wanted him to see the Messiah to fulfill that promise that he gave him. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago or last week, but again, this is after those years of silence, those 400 years of silence, where we have no recorded revelation from God, communication from God to Israel or anybody else. That's that intertestamental period from the Old Testament to the New Testament, those 400 years of silence. And we can take a look at Simeon's prophecy and we see a few things. If you have it open there, it says in, in verse 32, he says that Jesus is a light revealed not just to Israel, but to the nations, meaning to the Gentiles as well. And that he will bring glory to the people of Israel. And in verse 34, Simeon begins to speak about the life of Jesus, how he'll come and turn things upside down. And how many people will be against him. And as we see when we read further into the Gospels, we know that Jesus had people who were coming against him. Those religious leaders, those Pharisees, at every turn, at every corner, they would challenge him, try to trap him, try to get him in trouble with the government to, to stop his ministry from happening. But we'll talk about more next week there about God's plan for us. But when God has a plan... It will prevail, even when people will come against it. And then in verse 35, Simeon gives a personal prophecy to Mary, looking ahead to the suffering she will face when Jesus is crucified. She said, Simeon tells her that a, a sword will pierce your heart or will pierce your soul, your very soul. And again, this is something, realize this, Mary was young. She probably wasn't even 20 years old yet. And she was hearing this prophecy from Simeon. She And holding this six-week-old baby, she didn't know, she wouldn't have known what this prophecy meant. But I'm sure that, you know, when, a, when the shepherds came uh, to see Jesus lying in the manger, the Bible tells us that Mary stored these things in her heart. I'm sure all of these things came about when her son was crucified on the cross. Now she probably remembered this prophecy from Simeon and at that point on the, watching that scene on the cross or maybe even before that, watching Jesus being taken prisoner and, and then mocked and having the crown of thorns shoved on his head and being whipped, that it probably started clicking there for Mary. But at this point right here, she probably didn't understand exactly what was being said here holding the six-week-old baby Jesus. And then we go and we see Anna. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, 36 through 40, it says, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was a daughter of who? Here. Fanuel? Okay, Fanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. So her husband died when they had been married only seven years again. And that culture in the teens is when a girl would get married. Then she lived out as a widow to the age of 84. So from teens, probably teens, because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but to 84 years of age, what she was doing was in the temple praying, worshiping God, and fasting. In verse 38, it says, She came along just as Simeon was talking about with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. When Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth and Galilee. There the child grew up healthy and strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. So we don't have much information there. It's only a couple of verses talking about Anna there. But what's important to note is that she is one of the first people in the history of the world after the birth of Jesus 
to begin telling those around her about the Messiah, one of the first people in the world, which after serving God, worshiping him for the majority of her life, uh, fasting and praying, that was she went to the temple every day, it says there, and did those things, that would be a blessing to tell the world about the long-awaited Messiah, the one that Israel was looking forward to. Now, if you continue reading in Luke chapter 2, you notice that Luke, he skips forward from Jesus being six weeks old to Jesus being 12 years old. But there's an event that happens in the Bible that is recorded, not in the book of Luke, but in the book of Matthew, uh, that happens before Jesus is, his parents leave him behind in the temple. And again, I always chuckle at that, how the parents must have felt leaving the Messiah behind at the temple while they're, anyways. So, Going to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. I was left behind at church once. You guys know that? My parents, uh, they took, they're probably watching this, and I'm going to get a text message later talking about this from them, but uh, they watched this after their service in Texas there. But um, that, we were taking two vehicles because one had to get there at a different time than another. And I guess similar to Mary and Joseph, they thought he was with someone else in the caravan. My parents thought I was with the other parent in their vehicle, so they left me behind. We had like a 20-minute drive to the church. Anyways, I I don't hold a grudge about that at all, as you can tell. Matthew chapter no, I don't. <laughs> Matthew chapter two, verse one through twelve is where we find this other account that happens before Jesus is 12 years old. And this is again we we heard we read the, read this already with Cindy, but we're going to read it again here again. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. O you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. In verse 7 it says, Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Keep that in mind, the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother. Keep that in mind, the house. And they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure's chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Have you guys ever uh, looked forward to something or heard about something and thought it may, might be something that you would enjoy trying or doing or anything like that? Have you guys ever had that before? Uh, you know... I, Emily and I, we got married on June 22nd, 2013. Before that, I had some college friends there. They took me out on a bachelor party. Yeah, Christians can go on bachelor parties too. We went to the Mall of America, to the Water Park of America, which is located across the highway from the Mall of America. And then we like we stayed in a hotel. Oh, and the Cheesecake Factory too. So this, this story could apply to Cheesecake Factory as well because that was like, well, this isn't as majestic as I thought it was. But... That's not what we're talking about today. We were in the Mall of America there, um, and they have this store. I'm not sure if it's there anymore at all, but uh, what you do is you pay for like 15, 20 minutes, and they have an oxygen bar where it's it's this this oxygen bar where it has different scented uh, oxygen that you go in, and then you're, you're inhaling pure oxygen uh, for 15, 20 minutes or however long you pay for And I know that kind of sounds sketch. You're kind of like, man, that sounds like drugs almost. But it wasn't because it was out in public, you know, in a mall mall storefront. So it was pure oxygen, I'm sure. Um, Anyways, after the oxygen part, they would have uh, a time where you could sit in the massage chair. 
Now, I hadn't really experienced massage chairs before that, but, you know, I always, you know, people spent a lot of money on massage chairs, <laughs> Henry, uh, and, <laughs> and, and they, you know, they always seem to enjoy them. You know, massage chairs seem to be good. Now, I don't know what kind of chairs they had there, and I don't know what setting they had it on. Maybe it was like expert setting or something, but as I sat in there and it was like 10 minutes of being in the massage chair, it was... It was brutal. I, that is a day I learned I am not, I'm not much one for massa- massages myself, especially when it came to those chairs because it felt like, like, a, like a baseball-sized ball being driven into the, you know, the whole part. Like, a, like someone was just – their whole body weight was on one baseball-sized point on your back. and It wasn't comfortable. It would, it would lift you off the chair as it was pushing into you. And so I don't know why everybody likes massage chairs. So it's kind of disappointing in that way. But in the same way, you know, people, they hear the Christmas story and a few different details about it. Uh, some that we see, you know, we have a nativity scene right up here. Some that we see here, and and as we're going to go through this today, it can either be like, oh, really interesting point here when we go over this nativity scene. It might be maybe for some a little letdown or maybe for some just kind of a, that's cool type of thing. But there are a few misconceptions to our modern day nativity scene that we have, that you see around town, um, you know, in a lot, a lot of the churches, in front of a lot of churches in town. The first one isn't necessarily about the nativity scene, but about the three magi. We have a pretty popular song, We Three Kings of Orient are, and we read in the Bible that, well, I guess it depends, well, uh, is there any, I, I guess I didn't check every translation, but are there any translations that call them kings? I'm not sure if they are or not. But, um, you know, that's a very popular song, but they were not kings. They were, they were it'd be more accurate to call them wise men or magi. Um, they were a priestly sect from the Assyrian, or Persian and Babylonian empire there. Uh, it'd be more Persian. But um, the second thing there about the nativity scene is the Bible never tells us how many Magi there were. If you read throughout Scripture, it never tells us. The only reason we assume that there were three is because of what? The three gifts, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the Bible never tells us. There could have been more, there could have been less. And because at the time, well, were the Persians and Romans ever really in, on, in good terms? Not really. Uh, it, it wouldn't be hard to believe, or if you did the research there, that they probably had a armed escort as they were going into the Roman Empire to to find this as well. And then the third thing is where they found Jesus. You guys remember, I had you think, where did they find him? In a house, not in a manger. In verse 10 there of that passage, you can read that. Um, It says, they entered the house that Jesus was at. But Jesus wasn't born in a house. He was born in a stable in a a manger. That's where the shepherds found him because the shepherds found him on the on that night that he was born. So we get these clues here to show us that the wise men, they didn't come right at the birth of Jesus, which, you know, again, these nativity scenes, they, they're they made to encompass the whole story, not just one night of it, not, not just one night of it. That's why the, the magi are included there. But as we will read in the next passage, as Herod orders the death of all sons two years and younger, In Bethlehem, based on how long those magi had been following that star, Jesus may have been as old as two years old by the time the magi had found him. So let's continue reading there in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 23. It says, After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophets. I called my son out of Egypt. Again, God's plan will prevail. We see that being accessed there. In verse 16, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under 
based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be a Nazarene. So we see Herod's reaction to the Magi taking a different path, and we see him order the murder of babies. Uh, Josephus is an extra-biblical his, Jewish historian or an extra-biblical source that many Bible scholars go to just to figure out the history around this time period of Jesus' life. And Josephus called Herod a man of great barbarity towards all men. Someone who, he, who murdered his own wife and three sons. That was who was over the king over that time. So he's a barbaric man. So this new order to, to murder is what it is. Murder the boys that are two years old and under in Bethlehem and in the surrounding area. It would fit into Herod's wheelhouse just fine. He was a, a brutal guy. And again, when we go to Joseph taking his family to Egypt at this time, especially around Alexandria, there were a good contingent of Jews in Egypt. So it would have been easy for Joseph and his family to blend in with the other Jews that were already in Egypt. Now, we don't know the exact date of the birth of Jesus. Um, many believe he was born in 5 or 6 B.C. And this is believed because it lines up with other events that happen around this time. And again, going back to Josephus as that extra-biblical source there, he records the death of Herod happening in 4 B.C. So if this is correct, that would mean that Jesus couldn't have been born in 1, 2, or 3 B.C. because Herod wouldn't have been able to give this order then because he would have been dead. Uh, I mean, you know, the Bible, as historians use the Bible as a historical book as well to figure out the events that are happening during this time. So that's why it's believed that Jesus was born in 5 or 6 B.C. And then you get the question, well, why, why is our, uh, what's it called? Our uh, timeline? Huh? Like the B.C. A.D., why doesn't it match up more with Jesus? And I don't have that answer for you. I don't know. They, I don't know. Anyways, so... So yeah, but it was believed that Jesus was born in 5 or 6 B.C. there. But some other points to point out is the way that God made things work in this early life, in the first couple years of Jesus here. Again, going back to the last few weeks here, we know that God had a plan and that Jesus being born we, was, that, was that manifestation, was that us being able to see that plan coming into action. And how he also protected Jesus' family from attacks due to people's sinful desire. We know King Herod, the reason that he wanted to get rid of the Messiah is because there was now someone else who was threatening his throne. He did it for a selfish reason, reason when he ordered the death of all these baby boys in and around Bethlehem there. Yet the Lord protected them by warning Joseph and telling Joseph what he needed to do in order to protect his family. So we understand even today that Moving to a new country would be expensive, right? We know that for Joseph and Mary, they were not they weren't rich. And we get clues about this. Again, I, I had it was the first thing I had you remember today, uh, when they were at the temple there and what they gave as a, a cleansing sacrifice there. Um, in Leviticus twelve eight it says this about their about the type of sacrifice that they gave, addressing the sacrifice. It says, if a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, talking about after a woman gives birth and the, the sacrifice to make her clean, 
She must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One will be burnt, will be for the burnt offering and the other for the purification offering. The priest will sacrifice them to purify her and she will be ceremonially clean. So we see there Leviticus 12, 8, if you read the passage before then, that is what, if they can, what is it, a, a lamb? An unblemished lamb. I can't remember exactly what the more expensive sacrifice was, but the Lord gave this, uh, this opportunity for those who couldn't afford such an expensive sacrifice to do this. And we see that Mary and Joseph there, this is what they do. They take the cheaper sacrifice because, again, back then, uh, carpenters didn't make that much. And, and that's, we know that that's what Joseph was. And so moving to a different country would have been even expensive for them, but we can, we can see with those gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that even the Lord helped provide for the flight of Jesus' family when it was time for them to go into safety into Egypt there. So moving forward here, the other thing that we can go over, you know, again, going back to the plan of Jesus, we see his plan in action, and we see all these small details coming together, like the Magi bringing their gift to help fund the flight of that holy family to Egypt there, that God's plan will prevail. Next week, we're going to be going over the story of Jonah and what happens when you don't consult God when it comes to making those 2022 plans that you might have for the next coming year. But something that we can look at today is the reaction of the people who encountered the Messiah. The reaction of Simeon, the reaction of Anna, and the reaction of the Magi. Both Simeon and Anna, they praised God after they met the Messiah. Anna, she went and told everyone around her about the Messiah. We, that's an example for us in that whatever we do, I mean, Jesus being the Son of God, he didn't really do much as a baby because he was born. Okay, I take that back. He was born and the Son of God came to earth, but as a baby, he was just, he was just there being held. But they still praised him because they recognized him as the Messiah. The connection I'm trying to make there is that when we do things in this world, people shouldn't praise us, but they should praise God. Whenever we treat a neighbor with love, whenever we interact with other people, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God. People should be not pointed to how, how we are, but be pointed to how good God is in our lives, through our actions, through whatever we do. That should always be uh, our, our goal there. We even see, who is it in the, in the New Testament there? Is it Peter? Barnabas? They enter into a town, um, and the, they do some miracles, and the people start praising them as, as gods. They start praising them as Apollo or, or something like that, and they're like, no, 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 I am not God. You know, They w did not want to take the glory away from God. And just like that in our own lives, we should give all glory to God. We should use what God has given us, what God has blessed us with, our talents, uh, our way of showing love to our neighbors, and we should point them to the cross. We should point them to God. Just like Jesus' life and his uh, being born and presented at the temple, they began praising God about that. But then the other thing we can see is the Magi. When they came to Jesus, being somewhere between six weeks old and a couple years old, they began worshiping him. And this shows us that Jesus didn't become God when he was sacrificed on the cross. He didn't become God when he was resurrected three days later. But he was God from the very beginning. That the Son of God came to this world, flesh and blood, and he was God from the beginning. And so again, this is something hard, to, hard for us to understand, being 100% God, being 100% man. But Jesus was the Son and is the Son of God. And so when he was born, he, oh man, this is all uh, theological going into the depths there, but he did allow himself to be vulnerable. As a baby, babies are vulnerable. You leave a baby outside in the winter, it's going to die without being taken care of. They can't take care of themselves. They can't feed themselves. Uh, they can't clothe themselves. But he was God. And God, again, God had that plan, and he made sure 
that his son was taken care of here on earth. So Jesus is the son of God. That didn't start sometime later in his life. That was from the very beginning. He has always been the son of God. John 1 says that through Jesus, everything was created. Even from the very beginning, Jesus was there. So we know that he is God. And again, that should be something else to praise God for. Because the Son of God humbled himself, came to this world, took on flesh and blood, and died on the cross. So one of the ways that uh, we remember this or celebrate this, what Jesus did for us is by by taking communion. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great, you know, day after Christmas is a great time to do this, to come together and fellowship and remember, again, this has been the theme, what better way to, to cumulate? What is the word? Com- huh? Com- to get to the peak of this week, <laughs> then by taking communion, you know, the, do this in remembrance of me. You just said, and do it until he returns, and that's what we're going to do right now. So, 